Now, in other news, the wake of, in the wake of the latest conflict between Israel and Hamas in Gaza, some semblance of calm seemingly returning to Jerusalem, this including the resumption of organized tours to the Temple Mount complex, believed to be the holiest site on earth for the Jews and the third holiest site in Islam. A group of a few dozen Jewish visitors recently filmed walking quietly through the complex with police escort, given how the site is often a flashpoint for violence. Several Western media outlets, however, presenting the visit more like this. Fifty Jewish settlers backed by heavily armed Israeli police storm Al-Aqsa compound and occupied East Jerusalem. A headline only later deleted and amended after honest reporting responded with a tweet of their own, reading, Translation, 50 Jews peacefully visit Judaism's holiest site, escorted by police for their own protection. Of course, Al Jazeera English is far from the only apparently biased critic of Israel, reporting half-truths and whole lies in pursuit of anti-Israel agendas. The New York Times, for one, continuing its tradition of attacking the Jewish state by sharing fake victim photos, covering up victims' ties to terror groups, publishing propaganda maps as art, and excusing, if not outright ignoring, Hamas's terror tactics. Meanwhile, the BBC, among several others, just as bad, repeatedly blasted for decades of alleged systematic hostility towards Israel. Here in the studio to discuss, media analyst with Honest Reporting, Emmanuel Miller. Emmanuel, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. All right, so my first question to you is, you know, while I know that you've documented tons of this type of media, I, I want to focus for a moment first on the BBC, actually. What is the proof that Honest Reporting has for its allegations of decades of bias? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> and to be honest, there's plenty of individual examples of reports. We can talk about what's happened now the, over the war, over this operation, in which there were many reports that started the story from the middle. So, for example, at the beginning, we know that there were attacks on Jews. And the, that was called the, the, in, uh, the Intifada, the TikTok Intifada, in which Arab youths were recording videos of random attacks on Jewish uh, civilians, uploading it to TikTok for, for likes. And, and uh, that was what provoked a, a Jewish reaction. And then things spiraled from there, one could say. But that didn't appear at all in many reports. And that, that the, uh, the, uh, the attacks on Jews by Arab youths was something that wasn't even recognized and therefore readers at home wouldn't even know about it. And there were similar things, for example, we have the, uh, the Temple Mount crisis later on, and that was often framed as an Israeli incursion into the Temple Mount, into Al-Aqsa. And in reality, it was a response to rock throwing and um, missiles and fireworks being used as missiles, um, terribly dangerous things that any police force around the world would need to stop. But when you start the story from the middle, people don't understand what's happening. So, so let's maybe give credit where credit is due. How much of the BBC's reporting on Israel is legitimate? It's a tough question as well. I, I would say that if you're talking about individual details, they don't, it's not an organization that lies. It's not pure um, propaganda like we had that tweet from Al Jazeera. No, they don't call Jewish um, pilgrims uh, settlers and they don't say that they are storming Al-Aqsa Mosque, but it's not, it's not that bad. However, we were alerted to a tweet by a Twitter account called Nasha Jew, which exposes anti-Semites and Holocaust deniers around the world, specifically in Britain. And this reporter was working in Ramallah at the time of the last war, 2014. And she tweeted, Hitler was right. And she also tweeted some other horrible things. For example, during um, a terror attack um, in Hanoff in Jerusalem, um, she also dismissed anti-Semitism. You, you said horrible things that no reporter should ever say. And then she was later hired by the BBC. Um, three years after that, she was hired by the BBC. And then in the latest round of reporting, she was involved in the very making of the news that we were able to see around the world. So she was responsible for a report that attacked celebrities for not speaking out enough about the, uh, um, yeah. All right, well, so I was just going to say, I understand that there's actually... Uh, an internal report or an investigation in the BBC of bias. Yes. Where, where is that? Because that was commissioned in, what, 2004? 2004, so there was the Balin report. In the Second Intifada, there were many complaints about bias at the BBC. And it came to a point where they commissioned a report that was filed in 2004 and promptly buried. Um, allegedly, amongst the 20,000 words of this um, long report, um, there were so many damning facts in there that the BBC felt it had to um, to hide this report and it spent something like five hundred thousand dollars 
£330,000 um, in legal fees, despite the fact this is a publicly funded body and it owes the, um, the public transparency, it's declined to make the findings of the report public. Let's, let's talk a little bit more about this, because, uh, I mean, generally speaking, how much can you link maybe some of this coverage to anti-Semitism? Have you, uh, of course there's a link there, but how much can you say is causal? We can't, we can't say what's causal, but we can say that news organizations have a responsibility at any time to tell the truth and the full picture. And we also know that at times of war, there is often a rise in anti-Semitism around the world. And so when you have news organizations that are telling um, sob stories and they're telling one-sided stories just from, the, just from one particular party about the, um, the suffering of people in Gaza and they're not saying how people's lives in Israel are affected and they're not saying that Israel has a real problem that has to deal with it. And we know already social media impacts people tremendously. And television media and broadcast media especially and also the written media online that's the that that is the one chance many people have to see a different point of view and it is so important for the bbc and sky news and other organizations new york times to put out a balanced picture because some people just won't see the israeli side at all and when they don't they fail their readers and they and they, they fail their their viewers so i want to ask you who because presumably you've researched a lot of different companies and, and they're reporting on Israel, the Palestinian conflict, the Israel-Arab conflict, etc. Who is giving a balanced, legitimate, nuanced, context-filled retelling of I'm what's not, going on? I'm not going to give you the answer that you're looking for. I'm not going to point out any particular organization, and I'll tell you why. Every single news organization around the world has a particular bias, and that's okay. It's okay for us to want to go and tell a particular side of the story, so long as you are telling the whole story overall. And you can give an emphasis, so there will always be a bias and I'm not going to associate myself or my organization with any particular organization, um, other news organization, but what I will tell you is this. If you want to be a responsible news consumer, if you want to be a responsible citizen, make sure to get your news and views from across the scale. And if you want to know more about, about what's happening here in Israel, follow Israeli channels, follow ILTV, follow um, Israeli news, understand what's happening from a detailed um, local perspective. And you can also follow the, uh, um, the Arab if you want to. But if you're following only one particular perspective, you're not going to understand the, the full picture. Well, and again, just to, just to expand on this one more time, how much of the coverage that you do find is biased so in, 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 a, in a way that is indefensible? Yes. So you have, for example, what happened in the New York Times recently, where they had the pictures of all the children who died. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, they've got a picture from somebody who's not even from Gaza, it's not a child who, who died in Gaza, it's a, a Russian child. You have another uh, child who was associated with um, the Mujahideen br um, Brigades, a terrorist group, mm -hmm. and there's images or video footage of that child in uniform. So when you have a story that says these are the children that died, that, that might well be the case. Those are children that died, but that's not telling the whole story. Some of them are terrorists, some of them weren't even there. There are others who were killed and by Hamas. And I Hamas understand that a lot fire. of these numbers came from Hamas in and, the first place. And yeah, the sources themselves have to be challenged. You can't, you can't just rely on them. And so that kind of information is being put out there, and it's not fully contextualized. The average reader doesn't understand what they're seeing. And it creates a very negative um, impression of what's really happening here. It's just, just not accurate. All right. Emmanuel Miller from Honest Reporting, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.